Great. Tonight we're happy to have Bon Brandvik with us. Bon Su has been living near the hotel that we're talking about tonight for many years and is very fascinated with it and is very knowledgeable about it. As you can see, she's written many books about it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bran Sue, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it too. All right. Thank you. Okay, now, are you using that microphone? Do you want to? Um, I'm the, sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Unfortunately, I have one of those voices that drops off after about three feet. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay, if you can't at any time, please just raise your hand and go like this, and I'll raise my voice. Okay, um, welcome, and thank you so much for coming out in the middle of a hurricane. <laughs> I'm so impressed. I thought I might be the only one here, so I'm really glad to see you guys here. Um, now, for those of you who are not familiar with my writing, or maybe even not familiar with the Bellevue Biltmore Hotel, you might wonder what's so fascinating about its history. And to answer that question, I need to take you back in time to when I first became to write the, inspired to write this series of novels, and that was the year 2004. That's when I learned that the Bellevue Biltmore was in danger of being demolished by a different developer who wanted to build condos and everything. And the whole town was, the local residents were up in arms insisting that the hotel had to be saved. And up until then, I had to the Bellevue Biltmore to attend special events, you know, weddings, or they had a legendary Mother's Day brunch there, you know, things like that. Um, but I decided to tour the hotel just by myself on a normal day and see why the people were making such a fuss about this. And at the time, I already knew a few basic historic facts about the hotel. For instance, I knew that the Hotel Bellevue, as it used to be called, uh, opened for its first winter season on January the 4th, 1897. And I knew that it had been built by one of Florida's founding fathers, Henry B. Plant. I also knew that over time, the hotel had grown to a whopping 820,000 square feet. It was huge. And um, that didn't count the, the basement, which was filled with fascinating work areas and tunnels and that. Um, I knew that the, the size of the hotel made the hotel be considered to be one of the largest, if not the largest, occupied wooden structure in the whole United States. I also knew that most of the hotel was built out of the heart of the southern loblolly pine, which is a very special wood. It's prized because when a loblolly pine gets to be about 40 years old, the inside of the tree is so dense with sap, not even termites can penetrate the wood. All right, and now basically what that means is the bones of that hotel are every bit as solid as stone. They actually have more in common with stone than they do with wood. So I decided to start my solo tour in the elegant promenade corridor. Um, the entire length of the promenade corridor was lit by chandeliers in an arched corridor setting. It was absolutely spectacular. Um, it was the main guest passageway in the hotel, um, in the original hotel, and so when it was constructed, it was constructed wide enough that two ladies wearing hoop skirts could pass one another comfortably. Okay. Um, the walls were, of this hall were covered with, with photographs depicting the hotel and as it, as it was growing, all of its history, its amenities, and some of its more famous um, residents or you know, guests that had stayed at the hotel. Some of the photographs immortalized some of the most famous in the hotel, and that was a diverse list of notables from every generation. The Rockefeller, DuPont, and Vanderbilt families all stayed at the Bellevue. Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Al Capone, Sam Snead, Babe Ruth, and Joe DiMaggio, Charlie Daniels, Billy Joel, and Christy Brinkley spent part of their honeymoon there. And even heads of state like the Duke of Windsor, Margaret Thatcher, and United States Presidents Carter, Ford, Bush Sr., and Obama stayed there. Now, even though I was just beginning my tour, I was already awestruck with the hotel, just thinking that well over 100 years later, I was walking on the exact same four boards that all of these famous guests had once strolled. I found myself gawking at everything, and it was everywhere. The incredible photographs on the walls, to the remarkable details of the 30-inch wide carved crown molding and all the carved corbels at every corner. 
it was a sense of history that seemed to permeate the entire space. And you could feel it as you walked through there. I was literally walking in the footsteps of time. As I walked farther down the promenade corridor, it was like each room begged you to stop and look and admire it because each room was so different from the others. Um, one ballroom boasted an elegant ceiling of Tiffany glass that was all backlit, almost 100 panels of Tiffany glass in that room. Another one um, had incredibly high, like 20-foot high ceilings with twinkling star lights on the roof. Still another showed off intricate white wrought iron gates at its doorway, which I learned later were put in when that room was a speakeasy during the, the Prohibition era. Okay, um, and then at both ends of the corridor, they had very intricate box spiral staircases that led to the, the rooms way on above. And then in contrast, there were some extremely narrow wooden doors that led down wooden steps into the tunnels, and that was the, used by the workers of the area. I stopped to admire three tiny phone booths they had. One of those phone booths was built and in installed in the 1920s, right after pay telephones became a thing. Right? The other two were installed when the hotel was occupied by soldiers during World War II, so that the soldiers could, could make phone calls on Sundays, call home. And I could just imagine what it was like with lines of soldiers waiting for their turn to make a phone call in one of those little phone booths. As I marveled at the thing, I was noticing the phone booths and everything else. It was like every generation had made their mark. And not just you know, by being there, the feeling of the place, but they had made actual physical changes to the hotel. And they, they left echoes of themselves right there. And I could feel them with me. If these walls could talk, what stories they would tell, right? And that's when it hit me. I could tell their stories, right? By combining the actual history of the Bellevue Biltmore in the local area and, and put in some fictional spirit, spirits from past generations, I could bring the history of the hotel back to life. And by featuring spirits from a different decade in each of my books, I could tell the whole history of the hotel and make it last forever. I also realized that while technology and lifestyles and even laws have changed tremendously over time, People's desires and motivations have changed very little. Therefore, I decided to use my present day characters to demonstrate that some of the wisdom garnered by former generations was still quite applicable to us today. Now, needless to say, when I left the hotel that day, I had joined the ranks of the preservationists. Um, now, one visit to the hotel might have been all it took to get me on the preservationist side, but if I was going to write books about the history of this area, and if I wanted those stories to bring, I had to do a lot of research. So I spent a lot of time um, out at Heritage Village going through archives and through the library and talking to dozens and dozens of people who had stayed there, um, who had worked there, whose parents had worked there, whose grandparents had worked there, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I learned at that point that before the Hotel Bellevue was built, most of Florida was still untamed and considered to be or no value at all. You couldn't drive a buggy anywhere without getting it stuck in the sugar sand or, or you know, thick brush or sinking down into the you know, swampy land. And the water was so shallow off Clearwater Beach, you couldn't bring a boat anywhere near shore to bring in supplies or people or even go fishing. Plus, even though, even after the, the wars with the local Indians had stopped, this area had way more than its share of cattle rustling, um, gunfights. We had, uh, farmers had trouble coaxing anything out of the ground other than citrus um, and nuts, and, and we had extremely hot, humid summers that lasted the majority of the, the year, and that resulted in high mortality rates from the heat itself and from the mosquito-borne illnesses that followed all the tropical diseases. So I started really getting a sense of respect for visionary Henry Plant, that he could see past all of those flaws and know that if he built a spectacular hotel, that people would come down and that they would start to, to recognize the tropical treasures of what would become Upper Pinellas County. Okay. 
And I took several guided tours of the hotel, and I questioned the docents leading those tours, and, no, and I was that person. What about this? What about that? Right? And I also took several, um, I call them unsanctioned tours, of all the tunnels in the basement, and I climbed up all the ladders into the very top of the attic. I took pictures. Um, I've got hundreds and hundreds of pictures on my website, if anybody's ever interested in seeing it. And now, of course, I'm so glad I did that. Um, because I have pictures of everything on the inside. So if anybody ever tries to tell you, oh, all the wood was rotted, you've, I've got physical proof that it was not. Okay. Um, anyway, I learned that Henry Plant moved to Florida in 1851 because his first wife, um, Eleanor, Ellen Blackstone Plant, had contracted tuberculosis shortly after the birth of their son, Morton Plant. After her death in 1861, Henry poured himself into his shipping business. He started building the railroad and he amassed a fortune during the Civil War, uh, transporting goods and payroll for both sides of the battle. He kept all his money in the Bahamas, and that's the truth. Okay, in 1863, he met Margaret Loman life a decade later in 1873. With Margaret at his side, Henry continued to build his empire, and he, he, his goal was to eventually link the Atlantic Ocean with the west coast of the Panhandle, all with rail, and he did that. He came under the influence of, of writers like Harriet Beecher Stowe, who began to encourage to visit Florida, not because they were sick, but because it was a paradise of palm trees and colorful flowers and unusual and magnificent birds and animals. Um, and it had waterways of rivers and the gulf and the, the ocean that everybody could enjoy all of that in one location. So by 1884, Henry Plant's railroad ran all the way from New York to the Gulf of Mexico, and passengers could ride the entire way without changing trains a single time. However, there were a few hotels in Florida that would meet the demands of the wealthy patrons of the hotels, and none of them were in what would become Upper Pinellas County. So I discovered reasons that this particular hotel became so influential in the growth of the area was that Henry Plant was one of the very first hoteliers to understand the, the concept of total package marketing. It was his genius that he, Henry Plant would later refer to as his plant system. And what that was, was he meant he built railroad tracks to the doors of his hotel. If you were wealthy, you could, you could take and you could come straight to the hotel in your own um, Pullman car and park it there for the winter, All right? He built, um, he built them so he could transport all the goods straight from the ships, or, or the goods and people from the ships, or from wherever else they would come in. He could transport them to his hotels easily. He built oyster shell, shell roads between the railroads and all the stores in the towns so that people wouldn't wake, break their wagon wheels trying to get goods. So he made it to where his transportation system was the one you wanted to use. Um, he took and he, he didn't stop there. He built restaurants and shops inside his hotel and on other points on the property. He was one of the first people to realize once they're bed and fed, they need something to do. So he building all kinds of things for them to do. Um, he understood the difference between regular hotels and first class accommodations was to prolong that sense of perfection as long as possible. With that in mind, he built the tunnels throughout the basement so that workers would have plenty of room to do everything they needed to do without inconveniencing the guests. It is a concept that Walt Disney used when he built Disneyland many decades later. Um, he also understood that, like I said, once they were bed and fed, they needed something to do. So he provided activities, including concerts and dances, hunting, fishing trips, racing, and of course, golf. Right? And he that by providing all of these things, more wealthy people would stay at his properties, and also more of the money throughout their entire winter went back into his own pockets. They didn't go anywhere else to spend their money. All right. Um, now, when Henry's son, Morton Plant, inherited the hotel just a few years after it was opened, he added to the hotel's influence by building an additional wing on the hotel, 
And he started allowing some of his more influential guests to build cottages on the property, and they were kitchenless cottages. Right? Now, the wealthiest guests really liked this arrangement because that way their nannies and servants were at their beck and call, and the hotel worked out fine because the people still had to take all their meals in the rest uh, restaurants in the hotels. Right? Um, after four years of, of free residency, the ownership of those cottages reverted back to the hotel. So after four years of having built your home and lived in it for four years, you would have um, first right of refusal for the, first, for the winter. You could rent your cottage back. And if you didn't, they rented it to somebody else. Getting of the timeshare industry, all right? Like, to learn that before the advance of the um, passenger elevator, the higher the floor was in a hotel, the less valuable it was. Because can you imagine traipsing those stairs in these big ball gowns? So everybody wanted to be on the first floor. As a matter of fact, the fifth floor of the hotel was considered not even suitable for, for guest rooms. Um, it served as quarters for the hotel management and servants and nannies who were traveling with wealthy guests. They were the ones who got the view of the intercoastal waterway. Okay? Now, as I study history, I couldn't believe what an influential role this hotel played, not just you know, on, it, on itself, but on the development of the entire area. Um, the whole town of Bel Air was built, literally built around the hotel. The name uh, Bel Air came from Henry Plant. It was the town with the beautiful, healthy air, Bel Air, as same as he named the Bellevue because of its beautiful view. Okay, the hotel also served as the fire department, the post office, the telegraph office, the telephone switchboard for the new town of Bel Air and for the budding Clearwater Harbor, which of course eventually became the city of Clearwater and um, the governing hub of Pinellas County, which the hotel also helped make that happen, but that's a story for another time. Um, Morton Plant added to the plant legacy by providing a $100,000 endowment to the, for the first local hospital, which was built within walking distance of the hotel. Okay. In 1920, following the death of Morton Plant, John McKinty Bowman added the Bellevue Hotel to his luxury hotel chain. He only did that five times in the entire existence, only five hotels ever met his standards to be named a Biltmore Hotel. Um, the south wing to the hotel, bringing the total number of rooms in the hotel to 425, 380 of which were guest rooms. Now, the more I learned about it, the more I became really curious, and I started exploring every nook and cranny of the hotel. And I, I, a lot of the places that I had seen had been off limits to the public since the 1940s. Um, but I tried to sit in all these places and imagine what it would be like to be there if I stayed there. What would it be like if I was there as a worker? And I spent time exploring the underground tunnels. I examined the railroad tracks all the way through those tunnels um, and pictured how many loads of, of luggage and you know how, many, how much supplies illegal liquor, everything was brought into those doors and then they would use those little railroad pump cars throughout the basement tunnel to take it to the nearest door so that the servants could carry it up and they would you know, be very close to the rooms with the luggage or with the, whatever they were taking up, the laundry or whatever. I just don't know how many dozens of baked goods were made down there every single day. Can you imagine how great it smelled in that basement back then? I, I studied the old boiler and thought about how it used to provide hot water to the entire hotel when it first opened in 1897. What a marvel it must have been to come to a hotel and have not only running water in your room, but running hot water in your room. It had electricity from day one. You had three incandescent lights in your room. It was the height of luxury. I studied what was left of that old boiler and, and uh, Envision the, the soldiers who decade later had sawed all the pipes off of the, bo the boiler after it had become, um, you know, it was no longer working or anything. It was, um, but they were doing that during World War II when they stayed there because we had all the metal and iron drives. So they sawed all the pipes off of the old boiler and they did that. They also, that's when they took up all the rail cars 
um, because we had our own rail yard and the railroad tracks, they took those up as part of the, the scrap metal drives during World War II. Um, in addition to that, I sat by the giant ice keep. The ice keep in the Bellevue Biltmore was like an indoor swimming pool down in the basement. And I pictured the men, they would bring express trains down from the Boston ice houses with giant blocks of ice packed in straw, and they would shove them down the slide into this ice keep. And once they were there, then men would take axes and picks and saws and break them up into blocks of ice and carry them upstairs to the kitchen where they would keep them in the ice boxes. And they still had some of the tools that were still down there. It was amazing. In the St. Andrews pub, ah, wouldn't you have given anything to be a fly on the wall in there and listen to the men of the day play poker and talk about the events of the day while they're smoking their Cuban cigars? Yeah, how wonderful that would have been. Um, I imagine what it was like for the seamstresses who had toiled away in the basement shop. They made beautiful gowns for all the ladies who stayed there because there were balls every few days that you had to be prepared and so they would recondition dresses or make new dresses down in that basement. Um, I climbed way up in the attic too and I wondered how long it had been there since somebody up there oiling those wheels from the, the pulley for the, the lift that used to be manually operated before they came up with the electric elevators. Um, how long since somebody had been up there shoving old newspaper in between the heart pine? Because that's what they used for, for information. How long before they, they were taking screens off the windows and putting them up in the attic, you know, during the, the, during, as soon as they cooled off to the point that they could just let flow through? And like I said, I discovered that the loblolly heart pine beams up in that attic were as pristine as the day they were built. Um, I also learned about the changes that each owner made to the hotel over time. And I collected stories from anyone who had one to tell. You can find a lot more information about the history if you're interested in what changes each owner made. I've got that all posted on the website. But for now, let me suffice to say, my journey with the Bellevue Biltmore was just getting started at that point. Um, as I mentioned, back in 2004, the town of Bel Air was rallying um, up in arms trying to protect the hotel from demolition. And in 2005, they believed they had succeeded. They had, um, they had, the town had added a historic preservation order, ordinance that was specifically aimed to protect the hotel from demolition. And uh, the hotel was purchased and investment group closed it on the last day of May in 2009. I was the very last person to check out of the Bellevue Biltmore Hotel. And now, unfortunately, that will be forever because I had an agreement with them that I would be the very first person to check back in when the renovation was completed. Um, I established a, a website to record my journey. I was a budding novelist in the hotel's journey of a total renovation. It was all very exciting. I started publishing newsletters to chronicle both of our adventures, and I began writing the first book in the series. Pearls. Um, for those who, of you who aren't familiar with my writing, by the way, the novels in the Spirits of the Bellevue Biltmore um, series are um, other part history, part historic fiction, um, part paranormal mystery, and even a little romance there. So, um, but near the beginning of each book, a troubled woman checks into the Bellevue Biltmore, and when the guest goes to sleep, spirits. Um, who have, who really, you know, can understand her problems, take her back for visits in time. They visit her, their dreams and they share their memories. Um, and because each hotel's gifts, guest problems are quite different than the hotel guest in the previous book, um, they resonate with different spirits who take her back to a different period in time. And that's the way I'm able to tell the whole history of the hotel. Um, and I, I really embrace the concept that present generations can have a lot to learn from generations past. You know, throughout the course of each novel, the guest must figure out what the spirits are trying to teach them and how lessons from the past can help her create a better future for herself. Now before long, people from all around the world started writing to me and telling me about their own special memories of the hotel and, and since my um, website said I was writing, it was called The Spirits of the Bellevue Biltmore. Um, the mail started re recounting various paranormal experiences that they said they had had at the hotel. And they kept asking me if the ghosts they saw were going to be included in my books. And 
Um, but let me get back to that in a minute. Right now, it's the, sadly, the real estate market crashed in the United States, leading to the worst economic times here since the Great Depression. And that, the hotel's renovation fell apart. Because the hotel had already been gutted in preparation for the renovation, they couldn't just postpone the renovation and reopen the hotel. So my goal switched from sharing journeys with the Bellevue Biltmore to trying to save the hotel once again. I published the first book in the series in the hope that it would find its way into the hands of somebody who would be willing to invest the money necessary to save it. And obviously that did not happen. But the company planning the renovation lost its investors and it went bankrupt. The property was sold for the outstanding mortgage, which was a mere $8 million, all three properties. Um, the new owner split the property into three sections, the golf course, the beach cabana and restaurant, and the main hotel property, and eventually he sold each of those sections to three different owners. The company that purchased the hotel section of the property decided to demolish it and replace it with four condo towers and dozens of townhomes. In 2015, all the modern sections of the hotel were demolished. Afterward, the older sections of the hotel were deconstructed board by board so that the incredible, valuable loblolly pine and the amazing features of the hotel architecture could be harvested and sold as salvage. Now, several years ago, when they first built the condos down along the water's edge, six of the 12 magnificent cottages, and by the way, when I say cottages, most of these cottages are about five or 6,000 square feet, so not what I think of when I think cottage, but that's what they were called. So the cottages, um, six of the 12 were demolished in um, the early 1900s to make room for private homes and later condo towers, and um, one cottage burned down in the 1990s. The current owner demolished four of the last remaining five cottages. Um, so currently only one of the cottages remains, and that's the Eastgate Cottage, which thankfully um, was turned into a private residence several years ago. And that's the one, just as you go over the bridge, you'll see the, the cottage right in front of you. The rest of the hotel, it's magnificent ballrooms, it's amazing architecture, fascinating tunnels, the historic ambiance, they're all gone. Sadly, no future generations are going to be able to feel the echoes of history like I did when I walked through that hotel. So while I will always believe the demolition of the hotel was a tremendous loss to our area, I used it and I, I used that as a, a beacon to become more determined than ever to preserve the hotel's history in my books, um, not just, you know, the history of the ownership, but how it looked, how it smelled, the ghost story. Okay, um, and while people, you know, still contact me about the hotel, even though they know it's gone, uh, the most frequent question has become, what's going to happen to all the ghosts that haunted the hotel? Right? Okay, um, now, I'm going to address that in my fourth book, by the way. Um, each of my books carries a concept in the Last book is going to carry the concept of karma, so you can get what happened to the ghosts in the last book. Okay, um, but most fans of historic hotels agree that hotel workers and guests leave echoes of themselves behind, especially if they truly cared about it or were there for a long time, um, and that becomes part of the hotel's ambiance. And when these echoes are seen or heard or felt or photographed by people at the hotel several years, decades, even centuries later, that's what you call a paranormal experience or a ghost encounter. Now, right after I published my website, people started emailing me, like I said, about their ghostly encounters. And I think it's important to, to note that I didn't believe the hotel was haunted at that time. I just was trying to tell its history and trying to show that the experiences of people from generations past were still valuable and we should listen to what they had to say. Um, so, um, but they all started saying the same things about it, so I started writing it down. And initially, when you have a, a paranormal experience, a spine-tingling sensation is felt. Goosebumps might rise up on your arms and along your body. Um, there's an instant awareness that something is present that doesn't fit into normal frames of reference, okay? Um, there might be a, a, a rush of adrenaline as the fight-or-flight instinct is awakened within you. you. You have that 
adrenaline all of a sudden. Um, the rounding air might change abruptly, suddenly becoming cold or wet or breezy. You know, you'll feel things. Uh, ghost sighting or a paranormal encounter occurs in an instant and it most often disappears the same way. It's gone. And the memory of the encounter will remain crystal clear even long after the experience is over. And no matter how much logical thought and rationality you try to apply to it, there's still going to be an inkling in you that tells you, no, this was something different. This was not something I can explain. And you can never make those uneasy feelings go away. Now, as I mentioned, I mix actual historic events with imaginary world of spirits that haunt the hotel. Um, and so, I, like I said, I only intended the spirits as a way of demonstrating the wisdom and courage of the, the women and men um, who had lived there and stayed there as guests uh, years ago. But also in the world I create for my characters, novels, uh, spirits, and ghosts are very different things in my world. By the way, if you ever want to ask what is so fun, try to, I make up my whole world. I get to make up all the rules. I get to decide who lives, who dies, you know, everybody. Uh, it's a lot of fun. But uh, in the world, in my world, um, spirits and ghosts are not the same thing. A spirit in my book is simply a person as they were headed for the, they had passed away and they're, as they're headed for the lighted path, they decide to step off, sometimes for a little while, sometimes for a long time. A ghost, on the other hand, is only when the spirit, as it's going down the lighted path, splits apart, and part of it remains behind while most of it goes down the lighted path. And the, the part that stays behind in my world um, is generally the evil part of the person that was afraid of judgment beyond the lighted path. So where my ghosts, those are the, the specters, the demons, the whatever you want to call them, and those are the ghosts, but the spirits are just like us good and bad, all mixed together in one person. Okay, um, now, after a while, I re realized that some of the emails I got sounded just like other emails I had gotten. You know, so I decided, I said, what, this e guy emailed me again about this thing? And yeah, I had responded to everybody. So I pulled it up and I discovered the people weren't the same people. They were reporting the incident at a completely different point in time. They didn't know one another. And so then I started pulling up all my old e emails and I started really reviewing them. To date, a total of 20 paranormal that are, are, have been reported to me by more than one person, and those I call the 20 real ghosts of the Bellevue Biltmore. And um, those are the ghosts that we're not talking orbs, we're not talking, you know, I had an uneasy feeling. These are where they had an impression and it was of a person a time period, a message, everything that's so distinct that I could tell it from the others. All right, now, um, I tried to research some of the stories to find out, is there any truth to any of these? And I quickly found that that task was hopeless. The reason I couldn't find out if any of the stories were true was because deaths at prestigious hotels were covered up. They were never reported would pay off the newspaper not to say anything because there were so many superstitious people that they were afraid it would, it would actually hurt business for the hotel. And also, newspapers didn't used to write obituaries for normal people. You only got an obituary if you were somebody famous or if you were clever enough to die in a very unusual and interesting way that they wanted to put a story in about it. So I'm going to be always the first to admit that the phenomena that I described in The 20 Real Ghosts it has only been told to me by more than one person. I have accounts of it written down, but I will never be able to offer proof of it, except for a couple that I've experienced. <laughs> so, uh, but whether you choose to believe in the ghost stories or not, you can't deny that those ghost stories have become a part of the history of the Bellevue Biltmore. Um, so because they have become a part, I've incorporated them, not in the first book because I wasn't planning to do that, but in the second and third and fourth books, I've incorporated some of the ghost stories and some of the actual, you know, um, spirits and uh, things like that that made their stories into part of my story. Okay, now I don't have time to discuss all the 20, but I thought I'd give you a little taste of a few of the real ghosts of the hotel. And I'll start with um, what I call the Million Dollar Pearl. Um, it's perhaps the most famous ghost story of the Bellevue Biltmore. Uh, one year after Mary Plant's son, Morton, uh, was widowed, he met the much younger May Caldwell Manwaring. 
She was a beauty, and he was instantly smitten by her. The fact that she was married and already had a son did not stop him. He paid the, the, her husband $8 million to divorce her and allow him to adopt their son. Okay. As a wedding gift, Morton gave Maisie the deed to the Plant family home on Fifth Avenue in New York. Now, Morton didn't mind Maisie spending a lot of she did. She built the Olympic-sized pool with the tiles imported from Italy. She did all this kind of stuff. But when she had her heart set on a set of perfectly matched natural pearls, now this is before they came up with you know, manufactured pearls and everything, but the perfectly matched per pearls for a cool $1.2 million, even Morton said no. Right? But she was determined on those pearls. So Maisie decided to trade her wedding gift, the house on Fifth Avenue, for the pearls. The jeweler was interested in moving his business to a more prominent section of town, so he accepted the Greek, and he changed the house into his jewelry. And today, it remains the house of Cartier Fine Jewels on Fifth Avenue in New York. Now, after only four marriage, Morton Plant died of influenza, and Mary and Maisie inherited the lion's share of his estate. The remainder of his estate was divided equally between Morton's son, Henry, and his stepson, Mary, Maisie's son, Philip. Maisie lived long enough to remarry twice more for a total of four marriages in her lifetime. There is evidence that her precious pearls were sold at an auction after she died, um, but several members of the hotel staff claim that they see her wandering the halls, and it's said that she pats her throat when she sees somebody, as if asking where are the pearls that she loves. Second one I call fresh air. The windows on the fourth floor overlooking the, the swimming pool at the time um, used to open by, themself, by itself. Now, a previous owner once told me that he thought it was the spirit of Henry plant up there looking at the, at the water and everything. I'm, I doubt that, but there were a couple of interesting things here. First of all, the window was in a part of the hotel that was closed off for years. People were not, didn't go up there. It was, you know, they were boarded off. They weren't, they didn't get up there. So second, when the workers got tired of having to climb over there and, and close the window, they decided to nail it shut. A few weeks later, the windows reopened, and when the workers went up, they found the perfectly formed nails sitting on the windowsill. So that's just unexplained. The next one I call, have you seen my folks? And this is actually the story that started my collection because it was so unique that I, I was able to recognize it from the others. And to date, I have had six reports from different people about this ghost story, and it is about a seven or eight-year-old boy dressed in the clothes from the 1930s with the knickers and the little newspaper boy hat. And he tells people that he, has, he drowned in the old pool, which had since been covered over by tennis courts and everything. But he claimed that he drowned in the pool, and he would haunt the indoor swimming area. And different people from children, um, I've had reports from grandparents who had grandkids there who said they saw him, and they refused to get in the water of the swimming pool anymore. Um, we had uh, other people that said they're, they're, um, the kids were waked at nighttime, and he'd say, come play, come play, in the hallways. Um, he also had been seen in a, first, a couple rooms on the, the first floor, and um, even made contact with ghost hunts on the fifth floor. So this is a very well documented. And um, sometimes he asked the children if they wanted to play. Other times he warned them to stay out of the water. But in every single report I've gotten, he asks if anybody has seen his parents. He's looking for his parents. Okay. The next one I want to just talk about is the Tokabaga Indian. And that's one of my favorite sightings, just because it's a large wolf-like creature that several people have witnessed in the basement. And when questioned, they said it's much too large to be a dog or a coyote. They know exactly what they saw. Um, and to understand this, the bluff on which the hotel was built was once home to the ancient tribe of Tokabaga Indians. Uh, many ancient burial mounds have been discovered in the area, so a lot of people speculate that um, the hotel is built on some of these mounds. We wouldn't have had any respect for them back then. We would have ground the bones up right with the oyster shell roads, you know. Um, and so, including the hotel manager himself told me he said this, and, uh, 
He said um, he saw it, it was a, a huge dog-like creature that shifted into the shape of a man before it disappeared. So who knows? I, I, I think maybe it's the ghost of an Indian along with maybe his animal spirit guide or, or whatever. Maybe he's looking after the people whose bones are still there on the bluff. The next one is kind of a fun one. It's, um, I call it stage left. And there were two backstage dressing rooms for actors performing in the starlight ballroom. And if you were you staying there for a long time or if you had a lot of prestige, you'd be assigned one of these rooms and you could even have a cot in there and sleep in there. Um, so um, apparently the ghost of a young starlet liked to hang out in one of those dressing rooms and she didn't want to leave. So she used to lock the door and workers would have to go and find the key and get the door unlocked. And at one point um, I was talking to a, one of the guys who had done this and he said he opened the door and braced it open with a chair so that it could not close. And he came back just a few hours later and the chair was inside the room and it was locked from the inside. So eventually he fixed it by taking the door off altogether. <laughs> um, there's uh, too many cooks in the kitchen and workers claim that a uh, long departed kitchen supervisor watched over the shoulders of workers in the area and often let him feel his disapproval with a cold blast of air, even though there is no, there's no windows or anything in the kitchen. It was all vented you know, properly you know, um, for sanitary reasons and everything like that. And other times they had, it was a very high state, the fluorescent uh, hung from long chains. All of a sudden the chains would start swinging back and forth. The light would swing back and forth. Um, one worker told me that she was preparing a salad on a long table and without any, she was apparently not doing it right, <laughs> but all of a sudden the bowl and all the ingredients were swept right off the table onto the end at the other end. She ran screaming from the kitchen. She said, I, I didn't stop working there, but I never went in the kitchen another day, not one. So, um, and then the fifth floor boogeyman. Now several people have, they have been terrified by an ominous presence on the fifth floor. And it just exudes an aura of pure evil. You know, when you're around it, um, it just strikes fear in your heart. And they said that they were suddenly overwhelmed by the need to escape the area as fast as possible. They were in grave danger, that kind of thing. And uh, some claim that they glimpsed a shadowy figure following them as they ran down the hall, appearing in mirrors and windows and doors as they ran away. Um, Hulk Hogan's son was one of the people who saw that and did a, a ghost encounter on that, by the way, if anybody's interested in that. Um, but uh, I can empathize with the people because I once felt this myself. Out there with some friends to watch the sunset. I had a flashlight. I had done it a bunch of times before. It was like, come on, no problem. We'll head this way. And my friends. Um, went off to our right, and just as they did, something caught my eye on the left, and I decided to investigate and see if somebody else was up on the fifth floor or something where nobody was supposed to be up there. Um, so uh, I, I didn't see anything in the darkness, but just as I walked around the corner, I just felt all the hairs on my body stand up, and I felt just like I'm sure an antelope feels when it's cut from the safety of the herd. I was just like, Ah, and I just turned and I ran back to my friend. Still, I, I didn't feel safe. I, I, that feeling of impending doom didn't subside until I said, OK, let's go. Let's go back to the stairs. And I got them, without telling them what was going on, down to the bottom of the stairs. And I was still looking over my shoulder. It was a scary thing. Um, now, I did return to the fifth floor after that. I never had that feeling again every time I went up. But I will confess, I never, ever went up again at nighttime. <laughs> so, dancing throughout eternity. This is an opposite kind of, kind of encounter, and it's one of my favorites. I've had six reports of this, uh, so different um, re, uh, representing four different encounters. So two times, uh, it was a, a couple that saw it at the same time. And they would report hearing old-fashioned music, and they would follow the music to see, and it would lead them to the ballroom. And when they got to the ballroom, they would see a couple who were dancing, in the in the ballroom, and they didn't have feet or anything else. So it was, but it was full body. They could tell what they were, and they weren't shy. Some people claim that they watched them dance for a full minute before they just would disappear, and the music would fade away, and that was it. It was gone. Um, so, uh, 
And then the, finally, the last one is a group I call the prankster roommates. And, and these are the, peop the, the spirits who enjoy making their presence known. And, and they will, they'll do things like they'll move things, they'll open drawers and windows, and they remove doorknobs, or they just simply make noise. And so um, it's, I've had a few of the reports that with the overhead um, sprinkler system that was installed by the military during World War II, um, the, the, I've had people that say they, the pipes will suddenly start to rattle, um, even though obviously there's that happened. Um, one person told me that they, she actually saw somebody working on, on one of them, and they disappeared. Um, now when the hotel first opened, several of the rooms shared a bathroom with a neighboring room. And uh, the hotel rooms opened, oh, one ho of the doors opened into the corridor, and one opened in the hallway, which was the shared bathroom. Last several decades, of course, we no longer share bathrooms with our neighbors at a, at a fine hotel. So they started renting those as a suite, where one was made into, room, made into a parlor and the other as a bedroom with the bathroom in between. So now one guest was telling me that she and her husband stayed in one of these suites on the first floor, and in the sitting room was a small writing desk. And every time they came in the room, that center belly drawer was open up. And so her husband was one of those handy types. He's going to fix things. And so what he did said was, it's an old floor. It's tilted, and the drawer is just falling down that way. So what he did was he put a block under both of the front um, feet so that it was leaning backward, problem solved. And that night, um, they were waked by a rattling in the next room. And at first, they thought somebody was trying to come in the door of the, the parlor. So they got up to investigate. And what they found was that belly drawer had opened itself against gravity, had opened up. Okay. Now, when my husband stayed there the last week it was open, um, we stayed in a suite just like that one, but it was on the fourth floor. And when we were in there, we were talking, and we were talking about my books and, you know, that I was going to write and all that kind of stuff. And um, suddenly, the glass doorknob between our bedroom and the, the hallway to the bathroom fell off. And my husband made a joke about, yeah, how hotel needs renovations, all right, you know. So he put the, the thing back together, and it was no problem. It seemed to fit nice and tight, and we went out to the parties and everything that were going on. And later that day, when we returned to the suite, we discovered the glass doorknob had fallen off again. So he fixed it and he made sure it was very tight and we went to bed. And just as we were falling asleep, we heard a thunk and it fell on the floor again. Now, we just laughed and said, you win, and we just left it off for the rest of our, our stay. But just before we checked out, I remember I was the last person to check out of the hotel. Just before we checked out, um, we tightened that, that back on and left. And the ho nobody stayed in the room until three weeks later they were having a sale. So I went back to the room just to check and see if maybe a vibration would have definitely caused it to come off. And the glass doorknob was still intact. It was an interesting thing. Um, now the last story I want to tell you is Welcome to Bellevue Biltmore. And the reason I saved this for last is that when the lobby was built, the section of the hotel that you know, was later used as, as the lobby lounge, they called it, um, was a beautiful um, mahogany bar on one side. There's a seating area on the other side. Um, across the room is a spacious, the, the box spiral stairway going up, and the stairway is going down to the, the St. Andrews pub. And beyond the stairs is the main corridor for the promenade, you know. Um, and then be across that, be, beyond that was the terrace restaurant. So several people would report that when they came in that door, they felt a sudden chill and a sense that someone was standing next to them, to the point that they would often stop their conversations to turn because they felt somebody there turned there, and there was never anybody there. Now, um, and Margaret Plant, when they first opened the hotel, Margaret would often stand just inside those doors to greet people as they disembarked from the trains and came into the hotel. She would do a, a kind of a, a, a line where, welcome to our hotel, I hope you enjoy your stay kind of thing. And so um, what's more interesting to me is that this is the only section of the hotel that they saved. So if indeed it is plant who is welcoming people, it makes me happy because she can stay at the Bellevue Biltmore greeting people for as long as she wants to. Right? 
Now, before I conclude my presentation, I want to quickly mention that the first book in the series, Pearls, introduces Margaret Plant and features spirits from the Victorian era. Margaret Plant and the hotel are the only characters that go from book to book. So it's what we call a standalone series. You can read any one of the books, and, and you don't have to read the, the other ones. The second book, Ripples, features uh, spirits from the Prohibition era. when. Uh, this, the hotel actually helped keep this area on its feet during that area. That was the Great Depression. And smuggling alcohol on that railroad and the speakeasy helped keep this whole area afloat economically. Um, the third book in the series, The Redemption, involves when the, spirit, the spirits of the soldiers who lived at the hotel during World War II. And all of my books are available in print, ebook, and audiobook. Um, so the Spirits of the Bellevue Biltmore is going to conclude with the fourth book, which is going to be called Nails, and that storyline is going to feature the Florida pioneers who built the original hotel, along with workers involved in the demolition of the hotel. I had to figure out a way that somebody could, they have to be able to sleep the hotel in order to go back in time, so I have a, um, I decided my character is a homeless person on the thing is she's sleeping in the basement of the hotel with nobody knowing it as the hotel is demolished around her. So that'll be that story. But it's my sincere hope that my books will keep the memory alive of the hotel and make sure that future generations know the impact that this hotel had on the growth of this entire area and that it was very important. And with that, I'm going to close my presentation. I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have and autograph books if you'd like to have some of them. And I want to thank you again for, for staying with me. What is the status of the hotel? Um, right now, they, have, they saved 36,000 square feet, not including the basement tunnels. And they moved it about a football field away. They gutted the entire interior, and they're building it into a, a more or less modern little inn. Um, it will have a couple little touches of the Bellevue Biltmore in the lobby area, um, some of the pictures that used to be on the walls and stuff. But basically, it's pretty much gone. The, um, the, some of the condos that are being built, it's my understanding that uh, if they wanted to pay extra, they could have some of the Tiffany glass panels and stuff in, put into their home or have some of the, the wood used for, you know, either cabinetry or floors or stuff like that. But that's the status. So they say that the new inn is supposed to open in January. Um, it's just a wait and see. I was, I was really hoping that they would build it as a miniature hotel to put artifacts that are, or even not artifacts, just imitation, just, you know, make it look like the old hotel. But they've chosen not to do that. So, it's a shame. Any other questions? What, the, what was the cost of building this in 1897? Ah, the cost to build it. Nobody's ever asked me that question before. But I will tell you that Henry Plant spared no expense. He spent, he'd sent a crew out for seven years to search the area and found the area that was the best place for him to build his second hotel after he built the Tampa Hotel. And um, in seven years, they discovered that the hotel property was the highest coastal bluff in all of Florida and that um, it, was, it got the most days of sunshine of any part of Florida. And that's when he decided to build his hotel there. So he spared no expense. And he bought thousands and thousands of acres of land. Um, you've all heard of, maybe of Coachman Road. The Coachman brothers um, were the ones who built their sawmill on the property, and they cut all the, the pine for the property right there. And then in exchange, they gave him, um, they gave the two brothers a bunch of property that's now known as Harbor Oaks. So their, their business right there, the Coachman brothers. Is there anything preserved of, say, the first guest list of no, there is not. And we, we did lose a lot of things from the hotel. Um, when there was an unfortunate part when the Japanese took it in, in the 90s. Um, there were some things that were supposed to be put aside and saved, including register books and things. And from what I understand, they had sent some things to be preserved, and the woman had a car accident, and they were in her trunk. And she was hurt badly enough that, you know, uh, fortunately she lived and everything, but the car was totaled and nobody thought to get anything out of the trunk. So 
so some of the things were lost there. A lot of the um, antique pieces were lost during after World War II, when things were supposed to be taken out of the hotel and put into storage. Um, after the soldiers left, they went to the storage lockers to open them up, to bring all the chandeliers and everything back in. And there were crickets. That was it. Yeah. So they, everything was gone. Um, so we don't know what happened to some of those. But when um, the Powell Group rebuilt it after World War II, they did furnish it with antique pieces and everything like that. So a lot of it is not original to the hotel, but it was still antique pieces. There were uh, Japanese ownership, were there not? Yes, during the 1990s. Who bought it? Um, before, be, yeah, in the 1990s it was bought, and unfortunately, there, were, there was a cultural clash there, and the group that bought it from Japanese didn't understand America, um, had just been through you know, World War II, and, and um, we had closed down the Japanese gardens, and there were a lot of hostile feelings. And what they were hoping to do is make this the um, Pebble Beach of Bel Air. You know? um, so they were hoping to attract all the Japanese clientele. And they built a big round rotunda that was real good with feng shui and koi ponds. And that, of course, incensed everybody more because it wasn't the hotel's look and everything like that. Where they were looking at is like land in this amazing modern structure and then enter the Old West down this hallway. Um, we didn't like that. And then um, they opened, uh, they turned the restaurants inside into Japanese restaurants. And the biggest mistake they made was they put flagpoles out front and they flew a Japanese flag at the same height as the American flag. So um, the town rallied and boycotted everything about them and kind of drove them out and drove them out of business. And they did not succeed. And they did not have any support from the, the town. But that was during the 90s. And it was bought by other people, um, changed back from the Bellevue Mito, which the Japanese had changed it back to the Bellevue Biltmore. And it had, it had some real good chances. But unfortunately, timing just was not in our corner. That's the, what it comes down to anything when I say that the thing failed was the economic real estate things it just couldn't have been worse timing for the hotel. Just couldn't. Yes? What sure. is the name of that wood? It's the Southern Loblolly Pine. Lob Lolly. Lob Lolly. L O B L O L L Y. Um, and the, the Loblolly Pine is now, because we did realize it's such a spectacular wood. Um, we harvested it near, to near extinction, so now it's a protected species in the state of Florida, the loblolly pine. And where was the other hotel? Which other hotel? So they built another hotel? Oh, the Tampa Hotel. Yeah, the, it's now the University of Tampa, the one with the, the silver spires in Tampa. That's, that's, that's yeah, that's so yeah, so that was his first endeavor. And, and uh, he was competing with Henry Flagler, who is the, the other father of Florida. and. Uh, both Henrys came down because both of their wives suffered from tuberculosis. And so they came down from New York, and they got here, and there was really nothing going on. And they missed that competition, so they started competing with one another. And they started trying to outbuild each other on hotels and railroads. And fine, you take yours to Tampa, I'm going to take mine to the Keys. And, you know, and, and they competed, um, which much to the benefit of Florida because we grew and we prospered, and they built all these magnificent hotels that brought all the wealthy people here. But, uh, but when anybody asked, we, were, we developed because of tuberculosis. We had the nice, warm, humid air throughout the winter. That's what brought the people here. So, um, I'm sorry? Henry Flagler. We have two Henrys that are our founding fathers are Henry Flagler and Henry Plant. Henry Flagler opened the East Coast, took his railroad all the way to the Keys, and Henry Plant um, took his to the Tampa and built the port and had ships in the in Tampa Harbor and everything. So, any other questions? Thank you for bringing back so many memories. Of uh huh. The well, thank you. So much more. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> You're from Pennsylvania. My husband used to have a hotel for 48 years. 48 One years. Hotel, 125 yeah. years old. Wow. 42 rooms. Uh huh. By the time we done, we asked the historical society to keep it. Uh huh. 
historic society, no. Um, that's it. Well, that's, that's the other thing is, and we, we were talking about this earlier, is that Americans are, we, our culture has been new and, and good and, and, and just moving forward. But again, thank you everybody. I'll be here at the table if anybody wants to ask any more.